good. Perfect. Yeah, good evening. Um, I welcome you for tonight's um, talks in relation to coalition when scientific, when artistic and scientific research meet. My name is Uti Bauer. I'm the head of the program in art, culture, and technology. And um, this series is also in relation with a one-year-long collaboration with Siemens Stiftung in Munich. And if you have the chance, uh, we also would like to invite you to visit the other part of the building, the um, E15, uh, as it, E14, as it's called. It's the new Markey building. And in the lobby, we have presentations by Georgi Kepesh, by Attila Churge, by Jay Rim Lee, and by Goldberg and Fivovich as part um, of a larger unfolding of... Um, this kind of encounters between what is artistic research versus scientific research, um, where do they intersect, where are there really major differences, and this is a, also an ongoing debate that we have um, with our class in relation to that. Uh, tonight I'm very pleased uh, to have Laurence Grasson here, because we also discussed a little longer about uh, his projects, and uh, we would have loved to have his projects also here, but um, unfortunately our exhibition spaces are not secured, so his work are too valuable, but he was uh, willing to share it with, uh, with us um, in this lecture. Tonight he will discuss the ideas and the processes behind his HARP projects, which is a high-frequency active auroral research, actually that is uh, situated in uh, Gakona in Alaska. One side of this project was uh, already displayed um, on, on exhibition uh, with an array of antennas in the Palais de Tokyo in Paris in 2009. He will also talk about the studies into the past series, uh, which is a series of, um, it's actually, it's paintings that have been reworked, uh, and you will see that later, um, how um, science suddenly appears in these historical paintings in also to discuss the representation basically of science and how much do we understand if we see just a representation, uh, do we really grasp what the science in that is about or is it just much more an imagination. He also will talk about the Horn perspective that took place at the Centre Pompidou also in 2009. Um, Grasso's work could somehow revive a taste of paranoid uh, retro retrofuturistic prophecies pronounced by Charles Fourier two centuries ago. Uh, in fact, light, sound, radio, electromagnetic, electromagnetic waves, natural, paran paranormal, and materi meteorological phenomena are regularly incorporated in his works, but he also has um, complete other works like um, his contribution to the Charge Biennial, where he basically was working with the falcons that are used in order to do aerial surveys. Um, uh, and are usually owned and trained by the Sheikh families, which is a different angle that you might not introduce tonight, but just to say it's really a wide focus to address uh, such phenomena, also how we encounter, how do we map uh, our environment. Um, and by generating a tension between the works on show, the environment, and the sometimes dramatic projections in which they can give rise, Laurent Grasson creates snagging mental images they tend to obscure our view and what we commonly call reality. Um, he also has usually a large-scale multi-channel video installation, so the work is very um, multi-disciplinary, um, and um, yeah, I hope you have the opportunity to see some of his works. And in 2007, he actually participated in a show also at the Liszt Visual Art Gallery here at MIT. In 2008, uh, Laurent also was awarded the Marcel Duchamp Prize, uh, which, which is a very prestigious art award. And last year, he also was featured at Manifesta, the European Biennial uh, in Murcia in Spain. And um, the respondent to tonight's talk uh, will be Stefan Helmreich, who is Associate Professor of Anthropology here at MIT. And I'm very pleased that uh, you also took the time to join us, because I think it's very interesting to have this kind of counter positions or additional positions to even understand the differences. And at the end of the day, they do that to steer our minds and our imagination, but also a discourse around um, this field. Um, Stefan received his um, BA from University of California in Anthropology and his MA and PA, PhD from Stanford University. 
He also has worked as a postdoctoral associate in science and technology studies at Cornell University and was an external faculty fellow at the Center for the Critical Analysis of Contemporary Cultures at Rutgers. Um, his research examines the work and lives of contemporary biologists puzzling through the conceptual boundaries of life as a cate category of analysis. He has written extensively on artificial life, most notably in Silicon Second Nature, culturing artificial life in a digital world. And in 2001, he won the Diana Forsyth Book Prize for the, for, from the American Anthropological Association. His latest book, Alien Ocean, Anthropological Voyages in Micro, Microbiolo Microbial Seas, uh, is a study of marine biologists working in realms usually out of sight and reach. The microscopic world, the deep sea, the oceans outside national sovereignty. And this might be very interesting for those students who participated last year in Sean Jonas' performance workshop, which actually was about the deep sea. And um, Stefan is working alongside scientists in labs and at sea. And I think it's really interesting to, to have like um, people who basically watch scientists who have a view on science from the artistic angle and from an anthropological angle. So we basically have tonight two people who kind of are watching what is happening in science and what is its representation. So we will first have Laurent speaking. Uh, he will first read a text and then guide us through his work. And then we have um, as respondent Stefan. And then hopefully we have Q and A's. Uh, a Q&A session uh, with your participation. And let us now please welcome Laurent Gasson. Thank you very much. Um, could we uh, stop the light? Yes, thank you. So uh, thanks for your invitation, Ute. Um, I will start to read, uh, to, start to, to read the text first uh, with um, some picture of uh, the project I've been interested by and also some uh, of my artwork mixed in the same uh, diaporama. So it will be a little bit confusing for you, but uh, I will give more explanation after. So what I will read now is not linked uh, with what you will see directly, I mean. So I would like to begin this lecture by explaining what is my uh, relationship to science. I'm into extracting potential fiction linked to fragments I identified in the scientific field through contemporary mass media. So what interests me is the fiction potential of scientific matters. That means that it's not always accurate, I'm not always completely informed, but at the same time there comes a point where I've succeeded to in uh, identify, uh, identifying some uh, the genesis of some of my artwork. So there are three important things to say. Uh, if I base my artwork on these things, on existing research, it's because it's important to my work that the situation I set up have a credible basis. Thus, my work is neither a pure fiction nor the product of a scientific research. But the fact that my work and the situation I organize contain real elements help me work in a more cred credible environment between science and fiction. Second, another important thing that I will attempt to demonstrate is that often within science itself, things start with fiction. Things start with an utopian, a dream, a vision. That's why I got interested in the character of Nikola Tesla who, in my opinion, leads a life close to an artist. Third, the driver, research mode, and the apparition of my work is always on the border, which provoke a kind of incertitude, because it blurs the line between the possible and, once, and what seems to be impossible. For instance, um, while I was doing some research for my catalogue, I came across some image, some image of anechoic chambers. And by chance, 
had discovered images of an antenna. This antenna called the horn antenna sparked my interest because it had a shape which I found cinematographic. So I use it for two things. I use it to do a camera obscura, a sort of cone-shaped object which I fabricated using a window that was leading to a darkened room. I also, I, I also use it for an invitation card for an exhibit. Then for my exhibit at the Pompidou Center, it was contemporary mythology that prompted my thinking process, as it's often the case. It was the extraordinary idea of finding sound fossil. I imagine that it's an idea that has been developed by many people, notably a scientific name, George Sharpak. He recently passed away. He saw that material could record sound emanating from surrounding vibration. And he also believed that we could abstract sound through different processes. So in fact, this idea served as basis for my exhibition at the Pompidou Center in Paris and the one at Sean Kelly Gallery in New York. By chance, I realized the function of the horn antenna and I realized that it served as a tool for Penzias and Wilson to catch a frequency, the cosmic microwave background radiation for which they won the Nobel Prize in 1978. In 1964, while testing their most sensitive antenna, the pair encountered radio noise which they could not explain. It was far less energetic than the radiation given off by the Milky Way, and it was isotropic, so they assumed their instrument was subject to interference by terrestrial sources. They tried and they rejected the hypothesis that the radio noise emanated from New York City. And an examination of the microwave horn antenna showed it was full of pigeon droppings, which Pendias described as white dielectric material. After the pay removed the guano bulltop and the pigeons were shot, which physicists say the other ordered the did, the noise remained. Having rejected all sources of interference, the pair published a paper announcing their findings. This was later identified by Robert Dick as the cosmic microwave background radiation, the radio remnant, rem remnant of the Big Bang. This allowed astronomers to confirm the Big Bang and to correct many of their previous assumptions about it. So in fact, this discovery sparked my interest and motiv motivated me to reconstruct this object. Because all of the sudden, this object becomes a conceptual object which somehow pro proves the existence of sound fossil. And even time traveling, since we could have the possibility to hear but not to interpret. Indeed, there are sound interpretation with this frequency. So this illustrates how a different level of reality and interpretation can be uh, weaved within a single work of art. A documentary layers and interpretative uh, layers that allow up to link up a mythology, the sound fossil, with a scientific reality, the Big Bang. And so this mix which provides a fertile ground that I attempt to recreate in my work a territory where we can switch from the impossible to the possible, from a dream to an object. So, as I said before, one of the characters who helped with this research to create these territories where the border between fiction and science scramble is Nikola Tesla. In many ways, the Tesla method is that of an artist, but obviously also adding the ability to make possible and real dreams through the filter of his scientific genius. This is also why his life has given rise to many patents, but also a lot of novels and films. Moreover, he himself began to put in scene his, his discoveries. There are the dream he has been able to achieve, the AC current, but also the idea others have appropriated, for example, the, the patent for the radio, which he was finally given credit for on the year he died. 
They are utopia that were followed and studied by and developed to finally respond to real approach to new technology. And this many years after is just like wireless energy with the possibility of a free access to it. There are also more obscure experiments like the one at Warden Cliff or the gigantic high frequency resonator in Colorado Springs for the construction of a telecommunication towers. And last but not least, sorry, the creation of a, a giant aurora borealis in order to enlighten the earth. Like many of other artists, I share the same interest for this peculiar time of science. There is a real challenge at representing the world today because the field has become so complex and so specific that there is a kind of disorientation it is impossible today for anyone who is not a scientist to understand string theory nor quantum physics. And I believe those are also reasons why artists get so into specific time of science. I believe they represent a stable and reachable enough place and time where and when we can start to build a fiction. So I try to analyze this interest, and I think that unlike scientists who understand what science is today, our lack of understanding generates nostalgia for the history of science of the 19th century. And it's aesthetic because it gives the impression certainly false and retrospective understanding of what it was. So um, ARP seems the opposite of what may appear accessible today in Tesla research. On one hand, we have the vision of a highly fixed, fictionalized character, and the other, a, sec a secret military base which further increase our fear of not understanding the world around us. But there are links between Tesla research and ARP. To me, everything that surrounds the ARP project can only be based in fiction or better in coding. And it, it's a little bit the same for the story about Tesla. So in uh, 19, uh, sorry, in eight, 1899, Tesla moved to Colorado Springs and began his experiments on terrestrial and cosmic waves to find new form of free and unlimited energy. He then had the idea to use a phenomenon known as Schumann resonance. There is a cavity between the ground and the ionosphere which resonates at about eight cycles per second. This band, about 40 miles wide, is a kind of three-dimensional sound box in which one can transmit electromagnetic energy of eight hertz which, with almost no attenuation. Tesla planned to use a power transmitted, transmitter in order to heat this ball of electricity with an electrical pulse that would spread the energy released in the ionosphere. At the precise moment where the energy will come from the other side of the Earth, Tesla would send another electrical pulse and so on until the stored energy becomes so large that it can be captured by an appropriate area. So Tesla quickly abandoned his research. He discovered that the alpha wave frequency in the human brain and all animals is between six and eight hertz. It is the same band as the Schumann resonance. Um, in parallel, my work with the own antenna gave me the opportunity to build an object that allows the viewer to link the idea of time travel with a real scientific discovery. Uh, similarly, ARP is used to make a tangible concept, a weapon that would use an invisible energy in a world we can neither longer control nor depict. ARP, for me, is like a screen for the public to project their fantasies and their craziest theories, such as a remote to control the climate or the human mind. ARP is a place which seems to have all the quality to have a further significance than its shape. People are designating it like a mirror able to reflect their old fear, new theory of phantasm. This reaction 
up and imagining imagining a theory on object we don't entirely comprehend remind me of Don Delillo novel named White Noise. In his book, uh, airborne toxic event happens. The special cloud leads the character to fancy imaginary side effect. Up is based on the research by Robert Islung, who was himself inspired by the work of Nikola Tesla. So the following are several examples of the different level of accuracy in research that appears online. A little less than a century later, the early work of Tesla in the field of electromagnetic energy has been adapted by Bernard Eslund. And so this researcher filled dozen patents between 97, uh, 1987 and 1994, which constitutes the backbone of the project ARP and its spin-off technology in armament. Other things. If I was to make a metaphor, I shall say that besides the effect of a virtual antenna deployed in the sky in a given area of the ionosphere, a, soft or a sort of giant microwave oven is created. Furthermore, with the virtual antenna formed by ELF waves, we can truly scan the Earth's crust at extreme depth in order to make a, soft of, a sort of X-ray. In this manner, the U.S. military are proud to say that thanks to ARP, no country, no country can hide from them the location of underground secret bases housing nuclear weapons. So many scientists are, have spoken out against ARP. They have been published books and commissioned studies similar to Tesla. This place produces a lot of theories, sometimes fiction, sometimes paranoia, sometimes conspiracy. Once again, my intention is not to judge, but to show how this place draws attention to itself and how this reaction is symptomatic of today's world situation. It's very easy to get pictures, and I have only reproduced what we could find on the web, trying to generate the same doubt about the operation or the effect on viewer. Entering the exhibition Gakona at Palais de Tokyo in Paris, visitor, visitor had to leave metal object mobile device with the gallery attendant. It was an exhibition on electricity with other works that played with static electricity, the electric arc. So this created an atmosphere of mistrust and fear which was increased by the madness such tangled cables and antenna create. So I will show you now some, um, some picture of my uh, installation and uh, speak directly uh, about my work. So this is the exhibition I mentioned at uh, Pompidou Center, the own perspective. So for the exhibition, several objects were in the space. This is the sound. So my idea was to put together different object sculpture 
um, without the possibility to know their origin, uh, their time. It was not possible to, to know if the, I mean, for people who doesn't know the horn antenna, it creates a kind of ambiguity of what kind of object they were in front of. Um, same for the speakers. I decide, it was the second series of speakers I've done, and I decide to build those objects to create the same floating uh, feeling of an un unknown origin. Uh, it's not possible to know if it's a ready-made, uh, if I just ran the speaker, or uh, if I made the, the, the object. Um, at the end of the space, this was the first painting of a series um, of uh, uh, a series of painting named uh, Studies into the Past. I will talk more about it later. Uh, this object came from Nikola Tesla uh, laboratory. You saw before the real, uh, the real one. So, like for the horn antenna, um, very often my work is to use some archive document to build a, a new object and to do some link uh, to play also with the period, with the time of their construction to reactive object and to play with this. So, to talk a little bit more about uh, studies into the past, the idea for me was to create some primitive Flemish painting linked to my work. Basically, I tried to give to the viewer the feeling it could be in front of a, a real object that uh, we could have uh, taken from a museum. And uh, to, to give the feeling that I could be myself inspired by this object to do my contemporary video. So it was a way to add an element uh, in the history of art, an element of my work in the history of art and to play with the relationship between uh, uh, the object and sometimes the video. So sometimes I show the video and the object in the same room, sometimes not. And like many of my uh, installation, uh, there are different ways to read it. I mean, some people could not know my video and just see this object without connection, uh, but it, doesn't, for me, it's not a problem. Uh, what I like anyway, even if you don't know the video, uh, people who know the history of art can feel that something is strange. Even if the project um, I've done is a kind of scientific project for me because I involve restorer for the, from the Louvre and I really try to uh, rebuild those paintings with the same material, with the same um, panel of wood, everything is quite the same than in the 16th century. Here you can also, what I want to say also is that uh, each thing comes from an existing painting, except the elements that I add from my work. So the birds um, have not been uh, represented like that, but uh, the, the tree came from this painting, for example. So another kind of uh, trees, uh, the ARP uh, uh, antenna. I start to be interested by ARP and I, I did a video first, a 3D uh, video, very simple, just a traveling around the military uh, research program with some sound. So it's again, um, the same process, find some archive documents and uh, just, sorry, uh, build an object um, and uh, deal with this idea of representation of one uh, impossible uh, territory. I mean that it's not possible to, I mean it's possible to visit R but it's not possible to understand um, what he's doing there. And my work is not to 
do a judgment about that, but more to use ARP as a device and as a tool for my own work. So those are installation uh, view of the exhibition at Palais de Tokyo, Gakona. I do a lot of video and I did many projects with some special effect. So this is a cloud of pollen, um, a kind of invasion of pollen in the city of Berlin. For me, it could be one of the imaginary effects uh, of the ARP uh, program. Also, the first series of speakers have done. So, and just after here, the own antenna, but um, in the aesthetic of a 19th century lab. Um, I, I show this object in my exhibition at Sean Kelly Gallery, Sound Fossil. In the same room, it was possible to see um, this anechoic wall. This is the title of the, of the piece. Uh, it comes from uh, acoustic materials that you, you know, and I will show some other examples. Um, it was also possible to see this seal screen with a silver ink. The name of the series is Retro uh, Projection. So I use for that picture from the 19th century. This, for example, show a group of Mexican um, people. They find a, a meteorite in the 19th century. So the whole room, this is one of the three rooms of my exhibition at the, at the gallery. And this room shows some uh, relationship between uh, the object of their own antenna, um, waves, the idea of sound fossil, the idea of an object coming from the past, like this meteorite. And depending the point of view you have, um, in front of or not the six screen, it's not possible to read the picture. This is a, the real uh, picture. Um, it's funny because in the 19th century magazine that I use, uh, La Nature, uh, it's a scientific uh, uh, magazine in, in France. Uh, they used to do etching even when uh, the photography already exists. Because this is uh, the real... So I did many... Um, installation and work with the acoustic material. It's a series. Sometimes I use as a, as a single wall sculpture the object. Sometimes um, I put two like in stereo to create this kind of um, strange and secret activity. Many of my installation uh, try to show, try to, to put the viewer in front of a kind of device, a kind of laboratory uh, where he doesn't know what happens and he doesn't understand if it's on or off. This is a radio studio I've done for Palais de Tokyo. Um, I've done uh, a few radio studios, uh, sometimes in collaboration uh, with uh, uh, a, a real radio with uh, some shows and sometimes um, in exhibition around the sound uh, subject. 1619 was the title of one of my other videos. 
uh, a fake aurora borealis. Um, the aurora borealis is quite important in my work because uh, uh, the, the ARP program, the title ARP came uh, come from um, Ike, Ike uh, Active Oral Research Program, and they deal with aurora borealis. And there are some story, uh, sometimes uh, true, sometimes not, about the research they did connected to the aurora in the northern light. So for me, it was uh, interesting. Uh, like in many other uh, installations, to use a picture of Aura Boys because it has something very uh, seductive, and same times again, it could be a weapon, a kind of weapon. This is one of the first representation of uh, Aura Borealis that I found. Another one, an etching. Some other pictures that I've used in my series uh, retro projection. And again, one of the painting linked to the video 1619. This is one neon installation. Um, Souvenir du futur in Quebec, the same in English, uh, in uh, Seoul Museum, uh, the Leum uh, Samsung Museum in Seoul, Memories of the Future. So again, very often in my work, I, I, I try to, to imagine some impossible concept. Uh, it's linked, of course, with a series of painting, with some other things you, you saw before. Memories of the Future was also the title of uh, an exhibition I, I, I curate, uh, again, at Sean Kelly Gallery in New York. And uh, I put together um, artists dealing with uh, existing painting, uh, artists who try to manipulate the notion of time and uh, some archives, some document, basically, like I, try, like I try myself to blur the relationship with an object. This is another video uh, with a fake eclipse mixed with a sunset. For example, some neon light are always connected to each installation. So that, those are, again, the painting linked with the uh, Eclipse video. The f that, that one is linked more with Fra Angelico. The other one is a little bit later in the, in the history uh, of painting. Again, something more primitive. Radio Ghost, it's another uh, video installation. So, um, like for the speaker and for uh, some of the installation, um, what 
I was really interested is the history of technology and the link with paranormal uh, history. Uh, something really terrible coming up in the morning time around 7 o'clock. Uh, the computer, the electricity, you know, is broken, a lot of fire broken. And the fan, you know, is broken too. And the water getting clogged, it, okay? And the lamp is broken. Everything's broken in just one second. And I feel really strange, and then I feel really, really, really unhappy. I couldn't see them, but I can feel them. He always stand in the same place every night before uh, four, four o'clock in the morning. He will stand there. When the sun goes down, he will be there. My wife saw them for twice. I saw them for twice. Uh, he is a boy. He is a boy with a cap. We have no idea where does it come from. But my master told me that uh, he is your son in the future. Because I... So uh, the installation Radio Ghost was linked with the story I record about some paranormal activity in the cinema industry in Hong Kong. Um, if you see the history of technology for each uh, new invention, uh, some strange story uh, have been, uh, have been uh, published. I mean, for the history of photography, first people tried to, uh, to take pictures of ghosts. Uh, with radio, they tried to communicate with uh, dead people. With TV, to see some ghost picture. For each new uh, tools that we discovered, um, it has been uh, the, the, the opportunity to also invent some contemporary mythology. So I discovered di during uh, a travel uh, I did in uh, Hong Kong and in China that uh, many uh, story of ghosts appearing in uh, cinema shooting um, uh, were possible to, to, to hear. And uh, also I discovered that uh, before each shooting, uh, um, people sometimes organize ceremony to protect the shooting against ghosts. So I did this project, Radio Ghost, about it. Another radio st studio. So this is another uh, military research program, uh, Echelon. It's uh, something existing. Uh, this is a reproduction of the different spheres that you can find in England. This uh, program is in uh, charge to listen to all the communication and to, to detect some uh, words, some uh, dangerous words in the communication. This is one of my work. So now you can see the confusion uh, between sometimes uh, the archive picture or the real picture I could show and some of my uh, installation. So what interests me in this uh, program was the link between Buckminster Fuller and, it's, and the military application of uh, its architecture. This is a public uh, a project for public space. A screening uh, video room. Another video, uh, so uh, light, uh, neon light installation in, uh, in New York. The name is Infinite Light. Some other studies into the past with the flying rocks. Of course, I did the video with the flying rocks. And this is an Uccello uh, drawing. Uh, so it's, an old, it's the inverse of what interests me. It's a real drawing from the past, but the drawing seems to be a kind of a 3D uh, drawing from today, so I use it in different paintings that I have done. And this is a, a video called uh, Les Oiseaux. 
Is it birds? So the idea here was to mix again my work uh, with some real picture. I mean, um, I use birds as you saw before in my Pompidou installation, but they were fake. And I like also to confuse the viewer uh, showing this video with real birds doing some unreal shape in the sky. And especially, um, what was uh, interesting is that it's in Roma above the Vaticano. So it was a kind of contemporary miracle. And this is, again, some studies into the past with a link to a video I've done with a cloud moving in the street of Paris. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Laurent. And uh, I would immediately ask um, Professor Hemreich to continue with his uh, response, and then we go into a Q&A. All right. Am I audible? I'm audible. Um, I'm going to read a prepared script that's being beamed to me from a remote location, <laughs> perhaps harp. Uh, I'd like to thank you for inviting me and Loren for that amazing presentation. And this is what I have to say. What is in the electromagnetic realm around us? Grasso's work bends our attention to an unseen world, a world variously believed to be populated by the voices of spirits, the chatter of government conspiracy, the emanation of aliens, and even traces of the vibrating origins of all that is. We know this world well, of course, historically. It is a world nudged into being in the 19th century when physicists and others claimed that the world was made of waves, of vibration, visible, invisible, palpable, impalpable. Helmholtz called this vibrating realm the invisible atmospheric ocean. And that sea was ventured into by spiritualists and scientists alike. Gillian Beer, in her writing on waves and literary modernism, asks, quote, signs, science, seances, how are they to be distinguished? This vibrating world often sat just outside of signification, in the not yet articulated, in the not yet heard, in the not yet sensed. It was a world of uh, what Jeffrey Sconce has called haunted media, a world explored by radio hobbyists convinced that they could swim into that electric sea to contact, say, the dead. Uh, and the story of the Titanic is historically important here, where this is a disaster unfolding on the ocean, and it's kind of one of the first of uh, kind of world disasters to be experienced remotely over um, wireless. So the, the haunted mediascape that gets invented around this period 
is a space in which, as Loren was suggesting, people start to listen for voices of the dead, for voices of the divine, for voices of potential Martians, <coughs> voices of unknown origin. So why and how has the electromagnetic realm become so eerie? Because, we believe, it is simultaneously ethereal and material. Right? It's both invisible and really real. Right? It's both sort of a space of imagination and a space of substance. And some of this is about the human sensorium, which is um, not so magnetically tuned as, for example, uh, that of birds using that magnetosphere to fly north or south, or getting turned around when their perception is flipped by 180 degrees. Some of you may have heard on this morning's NPR uh, radio a story about flamingos accidentally migra migrating to Siberia because their sort of inner magnetism had flipped um, north and south for them. Um, so some of this story of how we understand the electromagnetic spectrum is about sort of the specificity of the human sensorium. But it's also, of course, how we think about that sensorium and how we think about the electromagnetic. We think of the electromagnetic as the background to everything. It has become the very fabric of the world. This is a visualization of the microwave background that Laurent mentioned, the kind of hum of the universe, right? The sort of residue, um, the residual electromagnetic fossil of the Big Bang, the microwave background. So where did the Big Bang come from? Um, historian Hillel Schwartz, in his forthcoming book, Making Noise, argues that the Big Bang was a kind of creation of its time, the 1960s, the days of VHF television, electric guitars, um, fuzz boxes, distortion, refrigerators that were unruly and making all kinds of sounds. It was sort of a time when everything was discerned to have a background hum, so no surprise that the universe had one too. So in other words, the Big Bang is not only a sound fossil, um, in this lovely term that Laurent uses, sound fossil. It's not only a sound fossil, or perhaps it's not even a sound fossil, um, and it's not even necessarily such a straightforward scientific reality. The Big Bang is also a social fact. It is a creation of the 1960s. Um, it is a filling of a heretofore empty space with fuzz, distortion, noise, feedback. Uh, Jimi Hendrix, right? Um, and so in, in an interesting way, I sort of thought of this when you were showing the recreations of the, of the, showing the Flemish paintings which anticipate your work, right? You could imagine that um, the Big Bang is itself a kind of artistic production that is made to kind of anticipate and warrant the notion that we live in a universe that's filled with vibration and noise, right? It's as though someone snuck into the museum of the universe and put not a Flemish painting of you know, what will later become a kind of Pompidou Center piece of video art, but rather you know, put this kind of scientific fact about the very world that we live in. Um, and I think of comparing space, outer space, to the ocean. So speaking of noise and silence, in the 1950s, Jacques Cousteau called the sea the silent world. Um, by the 1960s, however, it became a kind of riot of noise, and even earlier, actually, for scientists who did not enter it exclusively as tourists. So anti-submarine warfare was predicated on training submariners to listen closely for pings <coughs> and boings and echoes, all manner of which could be confusing and misleading and might be illusions. So there's something similar going on sort of in the middle 20th century about the making noisy of of this other space, the ocean, right? The, the universe is becoming noisy. The ocean is becoming noisy. Um, so you get these kind of magazine, magazine, you know, this is kind of an unsurprising kind of way of thinking these days about underwater acoustics, alien atmospheres, underwater ambient noise. It's a very soundful space. It's not the silent world at all. I'm going to play you a brief clip of a sonar um, instruction uh, LP. This was the kind of thing that people would listen to as they were being trained to, to understand how to hear sonar. I think this might work. Many different sounds in the deep sea are produced by unknown marine life. These sounds were given fish-type names, such as the Boeing. The Woof Woof. 
a sound similar to barking dogs. There's a whole set of you know, now digitized archives of all of these phonographic records which were meant as training devices and they were, it's, it's all about trying not to get confused underwater, right? So there's this space that's sort of not yet legible, it's full of crackling from unknown zones. Uh, this is something that I started to think about in my own anthropological work which um, has been with most recently marine biologists. So one of the things I was able to do in recent work was dive to the bottom of the sea in a three-person submersible by down two miles. And I spent a lot of time listening to what it sounded like, um, which I was told was no longer necessary because everything was visualized. We didn't have to listen to sonar. It was just sort of there for this comfort because otherwise it would be eerie if it weren't on, right? Um, but so there's this real transformation in the soundscape that, that I became aware of. And um, so this underwater sound world, I think, is something like this underwater, this kind of unruly underwater sound world is something like an audible version of the weird and multiple space that I think is these days the ionosphere as it is now accessed by and imagined by such uh, technologies as, as HARP. So I thought I'd just put the website up. Um, I looked for this on Google Earth and had all kinds of enjoyable trouble locating it. And then there's sort of, as Lorenz says, there's a number of sort of conspiracy theory type stuff out there that demonstrates that it's blacked out on some versions of Google Earth so you can't see it. Um, but yeah, so let me play with this harp um, thing a little bit. So yes, there are, to, um, to borrow a phrase from experimental filmmaker Craig Baldwin, a number of um, specters of the spectrum that are floating around here. This is a mockumentary about um, a period in this film sort of that is dated to the 1990s when a vast electromagnetic kind of war killed all of humanity, leaving us now, I suppose, in some kind of afterlife. And I'm struck um, by, by Grasso's notion of, he ends the paper that he uh, presented with, being, with this claim of being fascinated by incomprehensible situations that sometimes produce forms, right? So you have, you know, what is that array of things for that, that, that is harp, right? It is sort of, it has an aesthetics, um, but the incomprehensibility sort of leaves this residue of the formal that we can sort of do something with perhaps aesthetically. And I was reminded of a 1934 book um, by art historian Henri Fossillon, who wrote in this book, The Life of Forms in Art, quote, Form is surrounded by a certain aura. Although it is our most strict definition of space, it also suggests to us the existence of other forms, unquote. And this is sort of the animating argument of the book, that form always suggests another form, right? And always, some, in some sense, suggests otherness. And so those other forms, Grasso suggests, are often kind of after images or after sounds or backgrounds or background radiations that are in some sense diagnostic of maybe our contemporary situation, right, of kind of paranoia, contagion. And I want to present you then uh, briefly just to close with a little bit of an after image of my own or an after sound of my own from my, um, my own sound world of my office at MIT, which has a telephone in it. So a few months ago, I received a rather strange phone message from someone claiming to be with an organization that she called the Nephilim War Council, which is kind of alarming. And the message said, quote, uh, it has been brought to my attention that you have gleaned information from aliens regarding your underwater studies, unquote. Now, it is true that I have written about underwater sound and that I have, in fact, written a book, which is called Alien Ocean, as Uta mentioned. But this particular reading of my concerns was, in fact, not one that I really anticipated. And some Googling around led me into sort of an interesting blogosphere network of people who were worried about electromagnetic harassment and electromagnetic kind of radiation leading to um, you know, the invasion of their brain, brains and things like that. They're controlling me now. So, um, and yes, it didn't take me, me very long once I, you know, read up on your work to find, to find uh, stuff like this. I found websites filled with 
uh, spectrograms, visualizations of the ambient vibrations people had recorded from within their apartments, from within their offices, and other places like that. So um, bloggers offered readings of these spectrograms. So this is all done with you know, software that you can just buy. You can make a spectrogram of your favorite Daft Punk song or whatever. But you can also you know, use it to make a spectrogram of just what's happening in the room around you. And so this one is harp altered DNA with harmony. And the backstory for this is that the person who put this together recorded the ambient sound in her apartment in Oregon, I guess, or Michigan. It's not entirely clear. And then sort of went through it trying to hear and deconvolve various possible things going on in the sound and concluded that this was um, a harp um, interruption of the kind of integrity of her DNA. Right? So, and it, you know, so I was thinking just as you were speaking about sort of the making of contemporary mythologies or contemporary notions using this kind of the very latest technology, right? So it's not radios, it's not television, it's not telegraphy. In this case, it's you know, rather um, sophisticated algorithms for making spectrograms if you, you know, want to do that kind of thing that people are then embedding in a kind of set of worries about the electromagnetic sphere these days. I mean, this is a picture from 2010, so this is, this is now-ish. So, um, so since I'm an anthropologist, um, I guess I'm similar to Laurent in the sense that my job is not necessarily to denounce or facilitate conspiracy theories, although I can do that if you'd like. Um, but what I want rather to, to do is sort of second Laurent's curiosity about this wavy world in which we now, with somewhat unsteady compasses, now float. There it is. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan and Laurent. And I think I would rather like to go quickly into a Q&A. And I also just want to mention, I mean, there is, because you showed also like the kind of the, the um, um, in Berlin, this kind of kind of um, floating around of kind of like, how did you call that, like uh, poles, pollen? And I mean, we also have it in Berlin, we have it, it's called uh, the Devil's Mountain Teufelsberg, which is the leftover of the, um, of Buckminster Fuller's uh, and, and the Amer United American <laughs> Army's kind of um, telescopes. And it's also interesting that um, feeding into this conspiracy theory or so that David Lynch wanted to buy it for his guru um, in, in order because they thought it's the, the right place uh, for transcendental meditation. Mm. And uh, then it got stopped kind of by the, the Berlin, um, I think, um, city of Berlin to get transmitted. So I think these places always kind of attract, um, because th they are between science and fiction, and, and so there is always an attraction around that. And I think the newest, I, I would be very curious like about this recent debate about switching of the magnetic field of the poles, uh, if, if you ever thought about those, or like if you have something to say, because that, that's what's mainly discussed at this point. I mean, th did you ever encounter that one? Not really. Switching off the magnetic? That the poles will switch the, the south and the north pole, and this means all the e electromagnetic mm -hmm. fields in the Earth will switch around, and planes uh -huh. will lose their, um, they cannot navigate anymore. Uh, birds, like what you mentioned, right. birds can't navigate. Flamingos yeah. will be in Siberia, as you say. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't hear about that? No, I mean, they do move very slowly. Yeah, no, I just heard that this is mm -hmm. basically to come soon. Yes. <laughs> Did you hear of that, Laurent? No. Uh, if for the for the video in uh, Berlin, um, the idea was to to uh, to give the feeling that those little things uh, floating in the air could be attracted by all the electrical uh, um, activity in the city. So that's the reason the main uh, um, building that I used in the in the shooting uh, was uh, the Fernsehturm. And, uh, <laughs> it was a central object, uh, and of course, it was also linked with um, socialist architecture and uh, the, the notion of uh, a political power of architecture. 
and an inherent Tesla. Yeah. <laughs> but I see Shaw has a question. I have a, I was, as both of you were speaking, it occurred to me that one, one thing I'm particularly interested in, and maybe you, you could elaborate, is what seems to emerge in between, or the, the, the kind of in-betweenness of, of the disciplines. And when you go, when you look back art historically, you can see instances in which things are being proposed by artists that have a parallel in scientific research, um, whether it's like Jari's, or in the sense that there's a parallel and then there's an alternative history. There's sort of Jari's, pataphysics, and then you can start to see some, even some, how some futurist and surrealist work were really uh, informed by, by quantum mechanics, for example. I'm curious about how we value the, the epistemology or the claims of these alternative systems. Meaning, it's one thing to say these things are not exactly science, that they're in between science and fiction, if not science fiction. But I'm also wondering, maybe on this anthropological side, how we can begin to, to come up with, with ways of evaluating the, these kind of alternative claims that are both aesthetic and, to use a, scientific, a, a more accurate term, pseudoscientific. Right? What space do they belong in, these kind of theories that are not exactly crackpot or, or conspiratorial, but yet propose a kind of possibility, whether it's formal or aesthetic, to understand phenomena that perhaps don't fit into any other particular discipline. If that, if that makes any, if that quite, I'm not sure if that's wordly precise enough, but it seems like there's an area of in-betweenness in what you're talking about that's neither pure science in the Baconian sense of, of there's no method, if you will, but it's also not pure uh, uh, um, imagination. Maybe it's a kind of speculative materialist practice. I don't know. I'm sort of curious about that. You want to try that one? Um, as I said, I think there is a kind of gap uh, for <coughs> those interpretation, and I'm trying to find those territory and uh, without any uh, judgment to 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 understand, uh, I think that we have a, uh, f f f for science, for example, it's so complex today that it's not possible to understand really, and even between scientific uh, themselves, as we said before, uh, everything is so uh, complex and precise that from one field to one other, there are no relationship. And I think that as a citizen or as a human being, it's difficult to understand um, the, the world around us. And it allows, finally, sometimes more space for those uh, new kind of religion, new kind of theory, new kind of uh, interpretation. So it's funny because the world start to, to be so complex, and we are so advanced in one hand, and in the other one, we are completely lost, and uh, we are like, uh, I mean, uh, constructing some uh, kind of very archaic, very primitive uh, new uh, things to believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that the territory of the in-between is constantly in flux itself, and that's sort of maybe the interesting thing to, to look at. And the disciplines are certainly themselves not fixed, so what counts as operating in between them is also going to be negotiated and transformed over time. So that, you know, just to take a canonical scientific example, perhaps, you could think of what Charles Darwin was trying to do in Origin of Species, where he's deploying all these metaphors of multiplicity and family, you know, kind of against the grain a little bit of what people had been used to seeing those things do. Right? They weren't supposed to be used to think about relations between humans and animals. Right. There was, he was sort of walking into an in-between kind of moment there. Or um, I mentioned Gillian Beer, who writes quite a bit about Darwin. Um, he was fascinated um, by thinking about human and animal similarities by sometimes trying to behave like an animal himself. So if you read The Descent of Man, he has a whole set of speculations about peacocks and peahens and how um, peacocks use their feathers to attract one another, and he decides that he's going to experiment with this himself um, by using some peacock feathers to see if he can get the attention of one of his colleagues. You know, and it's all sort of reported in this very sober kind of um, prose, 
but he's sort of he's walking into this kind of in between space that, you know, doesn't quite add up until it does add up, right? When you think of his contemporary um, Alfred Russell Wallace, who you know forwarded the theory of evolution by natural selection at the same time, and also had a very robust belief in ESP, which he pursued with just the same amount of kind of vigor and rigor, right? But in retrospect, we think of those things as sort of anomalous and strange when they are very much packaged together. So I think, yeah, I mean, it's not so much a normative philosophical question as it is kind of, you know, because I'm an anthropologist, an empirical social question, what people decide counts as a, a viable explanation at a given historical moment is, is something we have to investigate empirically rather than asking whether it's, it's really pseudoscience or not. You know? But I, I just want to add to that that um, speaking with some of the engineers and uh, astrophysics professors here at MIT, they said sometimes they just as a hobby would like, if they see a science fiction film, they would say, hey, let's test that. Let's see if we can build that. Or let's figure it out. Would that work? Mm -hmm. And they said very often, I mean, not immediately, but they could figure it out. And then it suddenly the fiction becomes reality. Or I just showed uh, to Laurent today just to um, support that a little bit like uh, in, in Cynthia Brazil's group. I mean, up, up there in the um, companion robots group, there is basically Leonardo who is part of the gremlins. And of mm -hmm. course, in order to have a gremlin, they had to develop a robot who could do what a gremlin could do. But by that, you basically have an artificial gremlin afterwards. Mm -hmm. I mean, it suddenly exists in the real space. And so the borders are very tight. And or also, I remember, I forgot his name, the physics professor uh, who supported uh, Stanley Kubrick for 2001, mm -hmm. um, an MIT professor to basically help um, Stanley Kubrick to figure out um, uh, his film. Uh, on, um, and of course, there, I think this there's a cross inspiration. I mean, we, of course, there's this big field of pseudoscience, but scientists sometimes they're just they're challenged by something. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, and sometimes it's it's a pseudo theory, and then you just say like, let's figure it out, and I don't know. Some, uh, some places or some uh, um, situation blur totally this uh, difference between uh, fiction and science. Uh, what interests me in the art project, for example, it's like if you talk, finally, not a lot of people know this project. And what I like about it, if you start to talk about it to somebody who doesn't know the project, it looks like a fiction uh, movie, you know? Or if you talk about Echelon or some other uh, research, um, very often it looks like already like a fiction uh, without the help of the fiction itself. Mm -hmm. uh, and this thing I think very interesting is that all oh, finally uh, there are in the world around us some situation where it's already look, I mean, uh, stronger than a fiction itself. But maybe it has to do, I don't know, Stefan, what you would say, maybe it has to do also with military labs, because like I knew the HARP lab. Mm -hmm. And when I asked people here, a lot of friends of mine in Earth's atmospheric planetary, they didn't know the HARP lab. Mm -hmm. So I knew it more from other artists. Mm -hmm. Like, so maybe artists or like people, like they have a stronger, they're fascinated, like also by telescopes or like, like the, as you say, the forms or, if you take uh, Tesla or also Lev Theremin, I mean, there is a kind of fascination, mm -hmm. but then there's also a cross fascination by the military. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. maybe there's something that is already in this kind of more obscure space. Uh, I don't mm -hmm. know, what's your maybe take on that? Yeah, yeah or, or maybe some of the in-between space is not as in-between as we think it is. So the Theremin example is an interesting one. So Theremin you know, uses electromagnetism to make a particular kind of instrument and electromagnetism is being used for all kinds of other things at the same time. And we're surprised by that if we think that what he's doing is only music, right? But if we sort of think this is part of a larger sort of tale about electromagnetism, then, then suddenly those in-between spaces start to vanish, right? So if we think of the Big Bang as part of the 1960s, you know, it's not the only way to think about it, but I, you know, part of a whole kind of way of thinking about the world is humming which is sort of happening in all of these different cultural zones from, from electronics to 
musical production to modernist aesthetics to the appropriation in the West of Eastern meditative, meditative practice around the sound of Om, like that there's this sort of, that it, it no longer becomes some, that you can sort of remap what your explanatory apparatus is so that it's no longer surprising that, oh look, religion and science are doing the same thing because, well maybe they're not actually that, that different to begin with, right? Um, and you know, you could sort of empirically then track you know, who are the people who are circulating between putatively different com communities and you'll find you know, a lot of overlap so that in the late 1960s, there is a lot of traffic between you know, paranormal research and kind of you know, virgin, you know, the very beginnings of quantum mechanics, right? And sort of conversations about quantum teleportation you know, happen in the very same rooms as the ones about you know, spirit transformations across lifetimes, right? And there's sort of moments of overlap, right? And mutual kind of constitution of those conversations. And then different sort of tests of how you might want to validate those, whether those are experientially or experimentally. But we, you, know, you might think about them as sort of less separated than part of a, a, a conjoined fabric. Ian. So I thought, I thought I'd bring up uh, another example which um, connects to um, this kind of art, uh, science engineering um, pr process and, and the question of fiction. Um, here at the Media Lab, there was a, a, a project called the Food Printer, which uh, began as a, a 3D you rendering. You have to go a bit closer. Oh, you can't hear, okay. Um, so there was a project that began at the Media Lab here uh, called the Food Printer, which began as a, a 3D rendering, um, which was posted on the internet, and it became uh, real in the eyes of the press and the blogosphere before it was anything more than a sketch. Um, and this had a lot to do with the sort of the authority of the institution and the quality of the rendering. Um, there was never any um, intentional kind of misleading of the public with the with the work, but there was this kind of desire amongst journalists um, to write about the project and it was entirely written as though this was a done deal it was a produced thing it was an, it was a, a reality when in when it was in fact a design fiction um, so I think there's uh, if we want to sort of blend in the the field of design and engineering into this as well there's a relationship between media and representation and um, how things become real uh, in maybe like symbolic or discursive space before they become real mm -hmm. uh, as consumer objects or as, as physical things. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think the, the, the web is very important uh, as a tool of communication for, uh, yeah, to, to, to give a kind of value, as you said, or a kind of existence to uh, any mm -hmm. uh, phenomenon. Uh, for example, w what I like also with the web is that uh, uh, now if you do some research about art, you can see picture of my installation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. And you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's very easy to go to the point of where things are completely uh, reversed and blurred and uh, fake. Mm -hmm. And it's not only the things that we canonically associate with, with the technological or the, or the, you know, or the mechanical or, or the digital, but it's also you know, our very social habits and mores as well. So that there were lots of African-American presidents before Obama became president, and they were on the screen in Hollywood, right? And they're like this, there's a sort of subjectification, the production of what that world might look like, right? Or, or just even everyday kind of comportment that we have as women and men. That gender is also something that we get sort of downloaded at us from a whole set of different vectors that include movies, that include websites, that include this other machine that we call the family, right? That sort of produces these things as real, right? And then we, we get, we sort of start to forget that it is kind of this loopy production where they're always entangled. Mm. So as a person who's interested in understanding technologies that are unknown and sort of mysterious to me, and all of us, or most of us, 
Um, I, after seeing your presentation and looking at some of your work, found myself sort of in a relatively peaceful and interested, I don't know really how to, a kind of light and open, or I would say less on the paranoid side of looking at these mysterious things. And I was just curious if you're interested in helping people navigate the unknown in these ways or at all somehow participating, if you could say anything about what draws you to these technologies and if it has to do with how people would process it in, in this kind of a way. It all clear? Um. I think my, my first interest is that uh, um, what could be the position of a, uh, one artist today and what could we do? Um, I start to consider uh, my work as a tool to understand uh, the world around me. And also, uh, many times I um, construct a new project around one invitation by one uh, new uh, muse museum project, or I, I, I try to have different situation like that. Um, I don't know what I, I think that uh, the art world is uh, the the last uh, place where you can uh, invent some language without the industry behind. Uh, in the cinema industry, you have some language, you have some code, you have some length. A lot of things are uh, really uh, existing before there is a kind of frame. Uh, so I, I try to use my work to uh, investigate some new, uh, uh, some new situations where I'm my, I am myself uh, a viewer first. And I need this uh, kind of unknown uh, process uh, to, to, to start something. But after, I think there are different layers and differ, different way to, to, to read my work. And what I like is that if you come um, to the Palais Tokyo to see the art model I've made, you, have not, you, you are not supposed to know the project. So there is a first vision, like uh, a physical, uh, I hope, impact or vision of the project. And um, I think uh, it helps me to, to build situation. And after what I like also about the art world is that you can collect some additional an information and make your own vision of something. So I try to keep all the installation as an open system for the viewer without to, to tell him what he should think. Because I think that today this is the most uh, problematic uh, situation um, is that uh, uh, except this between space, uh, most of the time um, we are asked to think in a way. Uh, if you go to see a movie, there is 10 times the same uh, story uh, with the sound, with, the, with the, what you can hear. Everything tries to make you uh, uh, thinking one thing. So, uh, yeah, I try to, to keep it more open. Could you also say something a little bit about like the forms? Because like, of course, the scientific models, they're very fascinating in their construction. But of course, they also follow kind of a function. And I see similar things here in the different labs that, of course, they're, they're building like one of the astrophysics um, department. They're building this huge uh, telescope. And in order to keep it cheap, they use all of like ready-made sets they import from Russia. So there is this kind of web and, and then you have the HARP um, laboratory. And like, so you basically reproduce something that is not designed in that sense and it's not an artistic project, but it uses this obscure forms that come out of that function, this huge kind of like ears or so like, or the sound material. Can you say a little bit about your fascination with this kind of formation or forms? Uh, it's like the story I, I told about the horn antenna. When I first discovered the object, I was not aware of the function of the object. I was more interested by its mm -hmm. shape and the way 
it was similar to a cinematographic uh, horn. So I use it uh, to, to build the, the camera obscura. And after doing some research, I discovered the, the function itself and the crazy things about it. It was linked with my project. So it was two times, uh, I mean, two different chance to be interested by this object. What I like also is to create the impression, the feeling of a, a secret activity, of something that you cannot get first, but you can feel. So I, I, I like functional forms in a way uh, that allow to think that something is behind. And uh, that you can, uh, and also that, that they can help me to, to build situation with different uh, way to read what you see. I mean, there are also fascinating designs. I mean, if you take, for example, the Tesla, the, yes. the, the sculpture that you have, like, in, in, in which is an abstraction, and then you see it outside. I mean, these are quite interesting forms. And of course, like, we just invent new forms because, I mean, because they have to follow a different kind of function. And this is why we suddenly have a form we <coughs> never had before, because like everything we usually reproduce is following, as you say, already a precondition, a preconcept or so. And to break out of that, you basically have to look for something that didn't exist before, or you search for something that you don't exactly, know of. Exactly, yeah. This is really interesting about the research uh, of Tesla. I think he was a kind of um, a creator. Uh, inventor. Uh, it's really interesting. Uh, maybe you remember, I show some picture uh, of also the film about Tesla, where you see him with a um, light in his hand or a big uh, electrical. Uh, yeah, he's building these incredible huge spirals also. Yes, yes. Like in his laboratory. And those are like, uh, cr like uh, art installation in a way. Uh, but what the funny part about uh, some research about Tesla, for example, he tried to send electricity from one point to the other. And if I'm right, I have the impression that at MIT a few years ago, um, some uh, scientists have been able to do that, to send from one point to the other some electricity. So Wireless, basically. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. So. There is a, uh, an aesthetic part and also a conceptual part, and both are very interesting and very uh, yeah, sophisticated. There's one question, Nitin. So and, uh, you can easily understand uh, the uh, symbolic influence of uh, eclipse, aurora borealis. I mean, all the kind of situation I try to to use in my work. They, they come from this uh, very uh, strong power of uh, what we are supposed not to be able to control. Mm. But can you say something a little bit about this work with the cloud? I thought that was very. <laughs> You, you created that on the computer, or like the, the cloud that moved through Paris streets? The, the cloud was again, like um, many other, a kind of screen for people to project their own interpretation. So in the old history of painting, it's something uh, that uh, exists since uh, a lot of time. And uh, uh, this cloud could be linked to many different things. And uh, I keep it open, of course, again. Um, but it, yeah, it allows a kind of, uh, I think that video helps to build those kind of situation. Uh, I don't like uh, uh, video, um, too documentary video or too, uh, too um, when video are too close from fiction or, I like this kind of, uh, even with the, the use of 3D uh, special effect, I like this kind of uh, uh, space where you can, you, you know it's fake, of course, but still it allows you to, to project some uh, things about it. 
when we even have uh, complete religions that are based on uh, kind of Dianetics or so if you take Scientology or so like I mean there there's a, a, also a strong belief in some of those phenomena I mean, like that we really take it or like a number of people take it for granted I mean like we talk about conspiracy theories but like there are some phenomena like people really take for real and of course we can't prove it differently I mean there, there is this kind of in-between space that is not um, you can't prove it you, you, you cannot really deny it but you cannot also really say uh, yes one, to uh, it one story I use just for myself for the eclipse was a, a, a very interesting uh, conspiracy uh, theory that I found about uh, the miracle of Fatima in the Portugal in the 1920s. I don't know if some of you heard about that. And I, I read that some people believe the, the, the miracle, could, miracle could be organized by the US Army to make the faith stronger against communism. So I thought it was very uh, interesting and I, I imagined myself what kind of fake miracle I could create so that was the reason I, I did the, the eclipse work. But I thought this is like the, the, the most interesting part, I mean, the, the premium <laughs> I mean, uh, conspir in conspiracy theories. The idea that miracle could be fake. Uh, it allows, I mean, a, a complete, I mean, a, a very interesting field. I mean, I think. <laughs> Historically, that that was also the case. But I'm always fascinated. Also, scientists believe very strongly sometimes in this phenomena. Mm -hmm. I mean, my, uh, Keiko mentioned the, also uh, the discussion about multiverses. You cannot prove it yet, and we talk about the eleventh dimension in the meantime. Of course, we cannot grasp that at all. But uh, quantum uh, mechanics is already in in that kind of field of. It's not only in NYU. It's at MIT. It's at Harvard. Like they can prove it through the the research that it was the photons and the super colliders that, that basically um, our universes do split and, and become parallel universes and multiverses. So, but of course, who can prove it yet? Yeah, so, so there's interesting questions to do with, with, with faith, right? And with this notion of using various kinds of technological and scientific things as screens to project one's fantasies and hopes onto. So on the one hand, you know, there's a sort of well-worn well nugget about it's impossible to predict the weather. It's too difficult mathematically. But then, as you're suggesting, but it's tractable to demonstrate that there's more than one universe, which seems like a claim at a completely different scale. Like, within this universe, there's this thing that we just, we can't understand it. But what we do understand is that there's lots of universes, which is a really weird kind of double way to speak, right? But then that also then demonstrate that then also rebounds off of the the question of whether people think that HARP is controlling the weather. Well, if we know that there's really multiverses, don't tell me that we can't predict the weather, <laughs> right? That's got to be a simple problem next to knowing that there are 11 dimensions. <laughs> well, uh, I can of a uh, more specific question to Laurent. I think in, in, the present, in the beginning of the presentation, you make a remark on Tesla. And if I understand well, you remark you were saying that you can sharing certain kind of uh, artist practice from the way how the research, scientific research of him. I want to make a point that I think uh, in these forums where art and technology and science they can be discussed, I think we need to be also clear of certain kind of disciplines because I think that what I understand you could be uh, interested, inform, seduce, and, and even, uh, I will say, interested on the scientific research and part of your universe and your practice that I think is fine is your landscape. And it's an interesting, uh, I think, uh, respond to that or, or, or involved this part of the territory. 
But I think uh, I, we need to make a, a difference between uh, Tesla as an art practice because I think what is missing is the intention. I think an artist, he has an intention with his work and Tesla has a different intention. Even people like Leonardo, then he was an artist and also an inventor. Uh, we could make a difference between his uh, two practices. I think it's uh, creativity in uh, in both sides, in art and science. Is uh, I mean we could differentiate it, but art practice I think it has an intention that is totally different than scientific research. You know. Yeah, of course, uh, totally agree with that. No, is for your comment on Tesla as a near. Yeah, I, I, of course. Uh, I think that um, Tesla, and you can you can see you can see and you can feel it, is his, uh, in his own autobiography was a very sensitive uh, character, uh, almost sometimes uh, strange. Can feel some very strange things. He had some vision. He had some very strange and strong sensitivity about magnetism. And, um, but this is another part. I think that to uh, visualize um, his invention, he has to first create uh, some uh, project, first uh, conceive new perspective, new way to, um, to, to, to change the world. And uh, in, in one way, I don't, I mean, art, uh, I, I don't pretend nothing about that because uh, uh, I, I don't have any uh, scientific ability. And I think Tesla, in a way, I have a lot of uh, um, respect and uh, uh, a kind of fascination because I think there is an artistic part, maybe not artistic in the way we think, but there is a kind of creativity and there is also the possibility to make possible those uh, new uh, new idea yeah, and it is your perception of him and yeah, yeah of course is, and uh, the other is the, his intention to to be contributed to another kind of discipline i think it's two different things yeah, of course it's my own um, it's my own perception uh, perception and uh, this is the idea of my work to, to, to give my own perception of uh, what I uh, what I saw in the Tesla life. But uh, also the, the the part that we discussed before, it's it creates some new form also, and this is very interesting. Some aesthetic, some uh, object, uh, and I also like very much this part. But uh, I don't know any confusion especially today, between scientists and artists, of course. Uh, there is no, I mean, and as I said also, for, for me, what I like about science, what I, uh, what I try to find is the fictional part of uh, science. Yeah, I would leave it at that, and I really want to thank Florent for coming from uh, France, uh, and also Stefan to join us tonight. I want to mention next week we will have Jerem Lee uh, speaking about your research on um, burial practices, uh, the Infinite Burial Project, and um, addressing burial rituals, including cryonics, etc., coming to fiction here at MIT. And I also want to um, remind you for two exhibitions, if you have the time to see them. There's also the exhibition of my colleagues, uh, Gedominas and uh, Namida Obonas, at Volk Gallery in uh, Architecture uh, Headquarters that is called The Learning Machine, and it actually introduces a Sera meeting, like so to, to work with a new MIDI, kind of like working on uh, a, a kind of a new electronic uh, theremin um, table. And um, also my colleague, Anthony Montadas, has tomorrow an, in, an opening on academia at the Carpenter Center. So um, I really invite you to see also artistic practices versus our scientific uh, practices. And uh, 
See you either tomorrow or next week. Thank you for coming. <laughs>